Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I also thank for the kind introduction and RCC in general for the opportunity to be here. Uh, before I start, I have to say that for the sole purpose of proving that woodland history is not necessarily boring, <laughs> I inserted a picture of a person uh, being burnt alive into this presentation, so you can look forward to that. Okay. So the title of the paper is Traditional Woodland Management and Modern Nature Conservation in Europe. Uh, maybe the title itself deserves some explanation, <clears throat> so let's start with uh, modern nature conservation. And if we all live in this modern, so uh, you will all have a, an idea of what nature conservation uh, is, <clears throat> or what it should be, and it's not my aim here to provide some sort of a comprehensive uh, definition. But we can take, for example, a sentence uh, from a statement by the Society for Conservation Biology, which says that nature conservation is about understanding, valuing, and conserving the diversity of life on Earth. Okay. <clears throat> what is traditional woodland management? Um, now, traditional woodland management is based on a very simple fact of life. Here it is. And it is that if you cut down a broadleaf tree, it will grow back from the, from the stump or the root system. Uh, and I need to add at this point uh, that whatever I say today concerns really lowlands and hilly areas with broadleaf trees on them, and it does not really concern mountains with conifers. Uh, so the tree, as it is called, is coppices. So why do trees do this? Well, we don't really know. Uh, it is Probably this property of trees is older than humanity, and it's, in all probability it's an evolutionary reaction to something. But we, don't, we, we can, of course, never be sure. Uh, now it is not necessary, this property is not necessary for a thing to be a tree, because most conifers, with some expansion, with some, uh, um, um, excuse me, uh, with some exceptions, do not copies. Uh, and this uh, difference between broadleaf trees and conifers already puzzled uh, the Greek philosopher Theophrastus in the 4th century BC, who was the great-grandfather of botany. Uh, so he was already puzzled by this difference. Okay. Now, uh, if you wait about 7 to 10 years, uh, then your trees will grow up into a form like this. Then you can, sorry, you can cut them uh, like this to get a good crop of firewood poles, and you can wait. This, this is what it's going to look like in the first spring after cutting, so the trees will start springing up again. Uh, and if you wait seven to ten years again, uh, you can cut them down again, and this circle can go on indefinitely. You can repeat this probably as many times as you want. Um, now, this is what coppicing looks like in a 15th century Flemish book of hours. Uh, this is what cop a coppice would look like in real life. This is somewhere in Hungary. Please note also the standard tree here. This looks different. It's also a different species. It's an oak. This is grown from seed and is meant to be used for building purposes. Now. Uh, why were people doing this? Why did people? Why were people managing woods this way uh, for apparently millennia since the Neolithic? Well, first of all, coppicing uh, reliably and without much investment produces wood for heating and cooking. So this is the most important source of energy from in many traditional societies, and and it also produces firewood of the right size, uh, and it helps to avoid wasting energy because if you want to make a fire. You want to put little pieces of wood on the fire. You don't want to take a big tree and chop it down into small pieces because you live in a society where there are no power tools. So you just want to avoid wasting energy into taking a big tree and chopping it down into small pieces. This is what coppicing helps you to do. Uh, now, this is the one. Uh, so the product of coppicing can be seen in very many pictures in the Middle Ages and also in the early modern period. So this is, for example, the 16th century a prayer book, Hussite prayer book. So this is, this is uh, Jan Hus there, the Czech reformer who was burnt at the stake in the 15th century for his heresy. Uh, and what you can see here is coppice woodland. This is the product 
of coffee things. So what you can see, these are not big pieces of wood chopped down into little pieces. These are smaller pieces of wood tied up uh, into bundles that are called faggots uh, in English. Uh, traditional woodland management includes other things, not only wood extraction. These are the so-called non-timber uses, so they don't involve the re do not involve the removal uh, of wood. Uh, for example, one of them is wood pasture. Uh, as you can see in this picture, this is a well-known uh, use. And the other one is litter raking, which is much, much less known. Uh, the dry leaves of wood were used, as you can see in this picture, this is a historic photograph and these are current photographs. This is a colleague of mine. This is an experiment we were doing uh, in a wood. So the dry leaves were used as bedding uh, for animals and also as fertilizer. So uh, the dry leaves were basically a straw substitute. Now, traditional management was once widespread. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, the distribution of coppicing in the 19th century in Moravia. Moravia is, you can see on this map, is the eastern one-third of the Czech Republic. It's a region of, of approximately 27,000 square kilometers where I was doing most of my work uh, for the past 10 years. And we have comprehensive data, for example, from the 19th century. Uh, what you can see here, the red color is coppicing. And what this map is telling you is basically in this period, wherever there were broadleaf trees, they were basically, without exception, coppice. Uh, other kinds of uses were also very widespread. So this is for, for the same period, uh, also in Moravia, the distribution of main non-timber uses. So you can see wood pasture was quite common. Hay cutting in woodland was also very common. The absolute winner in this period is litter raking, which is practically everywhere, except in very heavily arable regions. So in sum, at this point, we can say that traditional management used the self-renewing ability of trees, to grow again from either the seed or the stool. It applied the smallest tree that will do the job principle, not to waste energy on chopping big pieces, that big wood, wood into small pieces. And third, that every single, basically every single piece of woodland had multiple uses, at least for a given amount of, of time. And this created, or this removed large amounts of nutrients from forests, so it created relatively nutrient poor conditions. And it also uh, created open forest, once again, relatively uh, much light in them. Now, this whole system, of course, changes in the 17th, but really only in the 18th and 19th centuries, when scientific forestry becomes the dominant management method in the European woods. And why and how this happened is, of course, a very complicated story. Uh, it has to do with change in demand, it has to do with changes in energy systems. It has to do with changes in society. This is not my, not my task today uh, to explain this, pro, uh, this process. But in any case, uh, scientific forestry was very much against traditional uses, at least in its you know, harder forms. Uh, and it preferred strict planting and harvest plants. It also preferred trees that tend to grow into the same shape every time they grow. Uh, and because it is conifers that are more likely to do this than broadleaf trees, uh, this is why they, um, they used conifers more often than broadleaf trees. Their ideal tree, uh, the ideal tree in scientific forestry was the so-called normal baum. This is a tree that always grows into the same shape. The point in this, because it grows into the same, same shape, you can calculate the volume in advance. That was the main point. Uh, because, as I said, conifers are more likely to do this than many broadleaf trees. Uh, the uh, sort of flagship product of modern forestry became plantations of conifers trees. Now, of course, this, what I'm saying, it doesn't do justice to other types of forests created by modern forestry. Uh, it doesn't do justice either to the heated debates that were going on in forestry circles in the 19th century, also in the 20th century. Uh, and it doesn't do justice either to the sort of national variance within, within modern forestry. Nonetheless, through a relatively long process, traditional management was gradually rejected. 
uh, in woodland management in Europe, uh, and in the end, often even banned. So these are examples from the Czech Republic. So it's the Czech Forest Law of 1960, which says it is forbidden to pasture animals and cut grass in forests and to take to rake litter in forest stands. So this is a blanket ban uh, on non-timber uses. 35 years later, coppicing is also banned. It's relatively recent, as you can see, but it's basically banned. A planned cutting of in forest stands younger than 80 years uh, is forbidden. Um, now, interestingly, by the time this process of rejection is complete, traditional management was rediscovered in a completely different context. Um, first of all, Nature conservationists in the 1960s in Europe, in England, but also elsewhere, discovered coppicing uh, as a sort of a, a utilitarian tool that helps to preserve endangered species. Of plants, as you can see, oxlip here, or one of the light demanding butterflies. These species that uh, I'm talking about are usually light demanding, so in lack of management, they tend to disappear. This is why nature conservationists started to use coppicing uh, to, to bring more light into forests, to save these individual species. This is what James Latham uh, recently called the utilitarian turn in conservation. Then, of course, other factors came into play. As you can see, people realized that fossil fuels will not last forever and they can be also problematic, for example, in an urban context. You can see uh, nuclear energy, which once promised to solve all our energy problems, turned out to be not so friendly. This is, of course, a picture of the Chernobyl disaster. And there are also new and surprising markets for uh, coppice products, for example. So domestic, domestic barbecuing is actually it's a huge market, and it needs coppice products in the form of charcoal. Um, later on, uh, the concept of traditional ecological knowledge emerged. And this concept says that basically the traditional management techniques and the people who possess this knowledge and the landscapes created by this knowledge, they have intrinsic values, values in themselves that need to be, or that are, that are worth protecting. Uh, and maybe at this point, uh, we can remind ourselves that uh, the rediscovery of traditional management within the context of uh, nature conservation is ongoing uh, as concerns our knowledge and of course concerning also the, uh, the effects of traditional management in woodland. So we might think we know enough about coppicing, how it was done and how we should do it and what it does uh, but also for example litter raking is much less known. So for example when uh, Burgi and Gimme published a paper in 2007 there discussing litter raking as a new tool for nature conservation, they did this with a question mark at the end. And indeed, uh, the results or the effects of litter raking are dubious. This is an experiment some of my co colleagues conducted, if you remember the picture I showed. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the details of the graph, but what this, what this says is that the litter raking in this particular forest that uh, the experiment was done in, uh, it's good for total species which you get more species which is good but most of those species will be annuals that is they will be weeds which is not necessarily what you want to see of course this is not to tell you that littering is necessarily a bad thing what it tells you is we really don't know about how it works and what it does and what it can do what it cannot do obviously we need more research and longer term research to be able to say uh, anything more okay right but, considering all this, maybe we can think a little bit more ahead. And perhaps there is more to all of this than the simple fact that traditional management, management can be used as a utilitarian conservation tool to protect certain species. Uh, maybe we can move beyond species to consider entire ecosystems. Because traditional management has been part of the evolution I think of European forests, and it co-created a system that systems that are paradoxically maybe seen as natural by nature conservation. 
So the connections between human societies and woodland are deeper than usually thought. And they can be best described probably as co-evolution, which is of course a term that Edmund Russell borrowed for his evolutionary history from evolutionary biologists. Some ecosystems can be seen as the unintended consequences of past management. And let's see a few examples of this, of what I mean. So this is a wood in the Czech Republic called Dubrava, that's oak wood. Uh, there somewhere in the southern part, southeastern part of the Czech Republic. As you can see in this picture, it's an oak wood uh, with relatively much uh, light in it. Uh, and this is a national nature reserve, a Natura 2000 site, you name it, it's heavily strictly protected as a natural site. And we looked at its history with my colleagues, uh, pollen, and you can see here, it's a pollen, two pollen diagrams and the written sources. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, as you can see here, and once again, let's not go into the details, this is the important bit. This is the, uh, this is the pollen percentage for oak, and that's the date there, 14th century. So we found that there was always oak in the forest, there's always light in the forest, but the current dominance of oak, which is supposed to be the natural state of affairs, is really only from the Middle Ages, uh, early modern period, 14th to 16th century, and through the written sources, uh, we understood that this has to do with the deliberate change in the management that favored oak. Okay. Now, does this make this place less natural or less valuable? My answer is emphatically no, but it puts it into a different perspective. Right. You can see another example. This is Jevin Woods, not very far from this first place. And here, once again with my colleagues, uh, we had a look at oak generation, and this is a wood with a very well-known history, where we know that management, coppice management, stops uh, in the 1950s. And this is oak regeneration, this is basically the, um, how, ma how many young oaks you have. Uh, and what we found is that once management stops, oak regeneration stops. Now why is this? Because this is a very difficult issue. The oak decline, as it is called, is a pan-European and even more than pan-European phenomenon. It probably has to do also with disease. Uh, and it definitely has to do with lack of light and lack of uh, management. And I think we'll do well to remember one Giovanni Garzoni, who was a 17th century Venetian uh, forest official. And when he was surveying some woods around Venice in the very early 17th century, he actually complained concerning one wood that there were many dead and half dead oaks in this wood and this was because there was not enough light and his idea was to increase management in the wood so there's more light there and the oaks stop dying. So in that sense it's nothing new under the sun, I mean providing there is enough sunlight. Yeah. Um, okay. um, now we also need to remind ourselves that our knowledge of the ecological effects of traditional woodland management is inadequate. Okay. Not, not least because the ecologically most relevant types of management may not be those best recorded. So for example, litter raking is extremely little recorded. Copying is very copiously recorded, but that not might be the most relevant thing in a given context. But even if our knowledge is inadequate or insufficient at the moment, I tried to argue today that uh, we sort of came full circle from the existence of traditional management through its, reduc through its rejection to its rediscovery uh, in the 20th century. So to conclude, uh, I would like to show you two sentences that are separated by three and a half centuries. The first one is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, 2005, and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was this big international effort to take a look at the Earth's ecosystems and it's very much based on the concept of ecosystem goods and services which really means that healthy ecosystems will provide humans the most goods and services. So at some point this says uh, that taking natural systems into account requires big changes in the way many institutions work 
For instance, by recognizing the influence that their actions can have uh, to either protect or damage ecosystems through different incentives. Now compare this to a Czech estate survey from 1651, uh, which when talking about the local woods, it says, there is wood since there is in them a good growth of underwood and standards for building can be utilized by wood sales every year without causing damage for approximately 20 florins. Now, of course, these two documents are not directly comparable. Uh, they mean something else by health. They mean something else especially by damage. But in my opinion, they are still similar in emphasizing the interdependence through management between humans and the rest of nature. And with this, I thank you for your attention.